Hey guys, welcome to Anchor to Truth. Today we are diving into chapter 46 in the book of Jubilees. So let's get started. All right, guys, let's do it. Let's start in verse 1. And it came to pass that after Jacob died, the children of Israel multiplied in the land of Egypt, and they became a great nation, and they were of one accord in heart, so that brother loved brother, and every man helped his brother, and they increased abundantly and multiplied exceedingly ten weeks of years, all the days of the life of Joseph. And there was no Satan or Hasatan, nor any evil, all the days of the life of Joseph, which he lived after his father Jacob, for all the Egyptians honored the children of Israel all the days of the life of Joseph. And Joseph died, being a hundred and ten years old. Seventeen years he lived in the land of Canaan. Ten years he was a servant. Three years in prison. And eighty years he was under the king ruling, ruling all the land of Egypt. And he died, and all his brethren, and all that generation. Yeah, so I know previously we were bringing in the, the concept of Jacob and he, you know, he getting to breathe easy and, and his whole uh, reunification with this, with Joseph and the whole family unit coming together. He says, it's good enough. This is enough. And, you know, he got the confirmation that, you know, Jacob, Joseph will be the one to close your eyes. So right mm -hmm. here at the beginning, unfortunately, you know, it's always sad to see the patriarchs die. You know, we know this is all ancient history, but, you know, as we've been going through these week by week, it's almost like little mini soap operas. You know, we're like, deeply entrenched in their lives like what's going to happen next and like you know oh so they met at the well and then she was pretty and then the thing and then thing mm -hmm. where you know it's like yeah and then joseph died um i mean excuse me jacob died and you know so it's kind of sad to see that chapter end and um you know 46 and now we have a new chapter beginning obviously but um just to, to finally have that moment where everything in jacob's life was fulfilled everything that he dreamed and all the visions and all the time with laban and the, all the stuff everything came to a conclusion and it was good yep and that promise right there is what i have highlighted right under that they became a great nation mm -hmm. so that promise is fulfilled and still being fulfilled yeah and yep. what's interesting about great nation is like so the thing that stood out because at first you're like okay great nation thumbs up good job but that means when they came in they were a nation and then now they've become a great nation. So they just added an adjective to nation. They've been a nation. When they showed up, it, like I said, we, you know, we kind of joked about the caravan rolling in. You know, they, mm -hmm. There was a ton of people that showed up. And all of Joseph's brothers and all his family and everybody who was attached to Jacob, they're all coming in. And they needed a land. They didn't just need a you know, gymnasium so they could put cots up. They needed a land. And when they showed up. They were a nation, and now because of all the good and because of Goshen and being fed and being taken care of, now they're a great nation. That's a big deal to be literally um, sent from your home, traveling on chariots and wagons, and then you turn around and, you know, a couple of years pass, now you're a great nation. You know, that's only God can do that kind of stuff. Only God can show up in that kind of way where you go from the ragtag group of people who's selling each other into slavery and dying and all this stuff and the, to great nation. Yeah, I think I think that does need to be stressed. I appreciate you bringing that up. The the great nation. I, don't, I think that means a whole lot more than there's just a lot of people, mm -hmm. right? They're they're very blessed. They're a righteous nation, right? They're doing good. They're doing right living. Um, and yes, they're very very blessed in all that they do. So they're blessed in children. They're blessed in livestock and land and all this stuff. And they have become a great. And I would even I don't want to add to scripture here, but I would even uh, add, I would add to it a, a great mighty nation, mm. you know. So I, I would assume that they are um, in a position where other nations are extremely jealous of them at this point. <laughs> we'll see that come into play later. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Good stuff. So what do you what do you guys think about verse two there? That's an interesting statement. Mm. The there was no that, there was no adversary that's right nor any evil mm -hmm. any not even a whisper or a hint <laughs> yeah all the all the days of the life of joseph in other words joseph was joseph was the guy he was he was their quote unquote savior mm -hmm. right he was the again quote unquote savior of the world around where they were like you didn't survive if you didn't, if it wasn't for Joseph. All right. So, mm. so yeah, I can imagine that they, he was honored all the days of his life. 
and no one would be an adversary because they wouldn't exist if it were not for him. Mm -hmm. That's just my take on it. Yeah, and and, and Joe, what I, where I'm going to go is I'm going to go right in between where we were, where we left off and where you brought it up. Um, so yet yeah, then there and there was no Satan, but a little bit before that and a little bit after Great Nation, we have this interesting part where it says, "What made them a great nation? They were in one accord and one heart, so that they loved each other." And everybody mm -hmm. helped their brother and they increased abundantly. So one of the first requirements, one of the first requests from God was to be fruitful and multiply. That, that's what they gave Adam and Eve. So these guys are doing that. They're fulfilling that. And then they loved one another. They're in one accord and one heart. So that in-between statement there is what makes them a great nation? Let me explain. And because the, the explanation of these details, these facts, these characteristics and attributes of the people that then caused that was the. That was the driving factor of why there was no evil. And so it's almost as if we get a small, and I know Kyle's kind of brought this up before and we've hinted at it a little bit, you know, this is a little bit of kingdom sneaking in here a little bit, a little bit of, Hey, if you were to kind of just figure it out and even just attempt the stuff the Bible was saying, even just try and do the stuff that it's talking about, then the evil is just kind of not in the picture. You're not going to want what your brother has because you're loving your brother. You're not going to want to murder your brother and you're angry with him because you love him. And you're going to continue to uh, increase because, well, you're taking care of business at home and you're trying to grow your family and you're trying to increase, you know, your, for your namesake because you want to honor God in the best way you can and create more eternal souls that then also follow God. So there's this like little interesting small picture. It's like a little bitty explanation, but it's so big. It's I think it's what caused them to be a great nation and it, what what was the result of the evil not being able to have really a foothold there. You know, they're like, hey. You should go cheat on your wife. And they're like, no, that's my that's my my spouse. I love her to death. There's not even a possibility I'm doing that. Well, guess what? Evil has no footing there because it's just like the temptations just don't work. We all love each other. We all are, you know, we all need each other. We we just got done moving out of tents, you know, in Canaan where we were starving to death, and now we have food and shelter. All the dumb stuff goes away. They're they're now at just what does God say? What does Joseph want us to do? How do we live the best way? Let's just do that, and everything else pales in comparison. Right. And I agree with all that you guys said. And and then I guess my point of view on this one's going to be that uh, this is also alluding to the fact that before this, I wouldn't necessarily say it was evil, but the enemy had to have its hand in control of what of Joseph's destiny, according to the father, because the enemy works for the father. Mm -hmm. So for all the way from the what happened when he went to go find his brothers going from the pit to um you know to uh what was the Potiphar. guy's name the Potiphar yep mm -hmm. from the pit to Potiphar there we go that'd be a good sermon from yeah, actually <laughs> and uh so from the pit to Potiphar to jail to now you're you know second in command of all of Egypt so the way I'm reading this for me is that Joseph is the covering literally for Egypt right now mm. through the heaven he is the covering for all of this but there's not going to be any more of this uh pit, pit potiphar's house jail there's not gonna be any more evil in your life he said to his brothers you committed to do this you know from evil and what you intended for evil god made good so to me the adversary probably played a role in the manipulating part on the other side that but it was but again he works for our heavenly father but it progressed joseph exactly where he had to go mm -hmm. so now okay. joseph you completed the test that's been given to you <clears throat> So now that stuff's over with you, you know, and I, and this is me. I think now he's literally the covering for all of his people. He's the covering of Egypt and the known world that time through the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And so that part there versus no, no Satan is because there's no foothold anymore. He is, he is literally an acting as a covering and especially for his, his people. And, uh, cause it says right there that it said, uh, do, 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 do. Or was it? Uh, so we go back to two. It says, and there was no Satan or any evil all the days of the life of Joseph, which he lived after his father of Jacob. For all the Egyptians honored the children of Israel all the days of the life of Joseph. Mm -hmm. So again, he's that covering. So whether the Egyptians look at his people as, man, they're all stinky herdsmen, it didn't matter. Hey, they're not our people. It didn't matter. It's because they honored Joseph. So that covering of Joseph over his family, they honored them. So they didn't bring anything, any, nothing against his people. So guess what they got to do? They got to thrive. They got to grow. And I'm going to tell you right now, I was the one that opens up the wounds 
And I guarantee you, man, they're probably having kids left and right. <laughs> I'm just saying, I'm, I'm, you know, later in the story in Genesis, we get the account where the, the new Pharaoh wants to kill all the babies, right? Mm-hmm. Before Moses shows up or right when Moses shows up. And, you know, and then of course the, uh, the, uh, what are they called? The uh, midwives, basically. Are saying, oh, they have the kids so fast. We can't, you know. <laughs> But I, th- I guarantee you there's some truth to that. I guarantee you these they were having kids left and right because when they left Egypt, they were rolling mm-hmm. deep with a lot of people. But again, for me, I, when I look at verse 2, it's, it is about, it's like, hey, Joseph, no more. There's no more adversary coming against you. There's no more of these, these, these days for you. And besides that, but now there's a blessing through you, and everyone gets to receive that blessing for your obedience. Mm-hmm. I want to kind of tie something in that I've been studying lately uh, that, that I've just been going over and over and over again. Um, I guess I'm just going to roll with it and, and, and see what you guys have to say about it. But when I, when I read, when I read this uh, and there was no Satan, no adversary, nor any evil, all the days of the life of Joseph, I immediately thought about, you know, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Right. Mm -hmm. And okay. Resist. How do I resist? By not doing the things that he wants me to do, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, if I'm not doing the things that he wants me to do, then I'm clearly doing the opposite of that. Okay, well, that is the definition of righteous living, right? Mm -hmm. So, if there is no adversary or any evil, then this dude is living a righteous life. And I hear it said so often, um by churchy all of churchianity out there that you know nobody's perfect and i, I mean we're, we're, we're guilty of saying that you know all the time uh, nobody's perfect right we can't we can't live a perfect life but is that what scripture says you know i understand that i can't do anything about what was done in the past right you, yeshua's got that covered for me but are you sure we can't live a perfectly righteous life after this from this point forward. And so let me just read this real quick. Um, this was, um, this is coming out of second Peter chapter one. And I will start, I'll start with verse four through these, there have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises so that through these, you might be partakers of the mighty like nature, having escaped from the corruption in the world caused by lust And for this reason, do your utmost to add to your belief uprightness. To uprightness, knowledge. To knowledge, self-control. To self-control, endurance. To endurance, reverence. To reverence, brotherly affection. And to brotherly affection, love. For if these are in you and increase, they cause you to be neither inactive nor without fruit in the knowledge of our Master Yeshua Messiah. For he who in the whom for he in whom these are not present is blind, being short sighted, and has forgotten that he has been cleansed from his old sins. And this is the part that gets me right here. For this reason, brothers, verse ten, for this reason, brothers, all the more do your utmost to make firm your calling and choosing. For if you are doing these matters, you shall never stumble at all. Verse 11, for in this way, an entrance into the everlasting reign of our master and savior, Yeshua Messiah, shall be richly supplied to you. That statement at the end of verse 10, for if you are doing these matters, you shall never stumble at all. Sounds like living a perfectly righteous life. If you are doing these things and they are increasing in you, you are living a perfectly righteous life. Mm. Scripture is telling us we can do that. Peter is telling us we can do that. Be holy for I am holy. Be mm. set apart. Be perfect. Good stuff. Well, and to kind of add, uh, add a little bit to what you're saying, because, you know, it's it's funny. I've actually been having this conversation recently about, who was called perfect in the Bible. And they're like, oh, there's none perfect but the Messiah. And you're like, yeah, cool, cool. Yeah, that, that's a true statement for sure. But then what about like John's dad and Elizabeth? Weren't they called perfect? What about Noah and Seth and Job? Weren't they called perfect? 
So what, what I think what happens is our definition of perfect means like, you know, a clean white sheet of paper with nothing on it, where in, in God's eyes, it's like you're living the life that humans were designed to live mm -hmm. with with sin in in the picture, of course. And when you sin, there's a way to deal with it and a way to atone for it, which gets you back in right standing. So you can be a perfected human because you are constantly doing what you're supposed to. Hey, I stole from somebody. I give it back. I pay them back 20 percent done and done now you have to repent and not do it again you can't keep going back to the well on that but if you if you made a mistake and you truly fixed it then you're back clean you know you're your guys not looking at you with that stain of you know forever that one time when you were 12 years old and you stole bubble gum i don't think i'll ever forget that and i'm going to condemn you for it for the rest of your life so you know we do maintain a level of righteousness and and you know being holy and being perfect as these other men and women throughout scripture but it's because god in his system already set up for you're going to make mistakes. I already know that, but here's how you deal with it. And here's how you deal with it correctly. And then when you're have you corrected all things, you've dealt with all things correctly, me and you are good to go. And so, yeah, that temptation, that sin's always, you know, like uh, with Cain, you know, sin's knocking at the door, you know, often in our lives, sin's always there, you know, the potential, you know, you, five minute drive from anywhere you're at, you could probably go find a sin or just go look in the mirror. There's, there's a hundred ways to sin in a hundred different ways mm -hmm. without much effort. But it's like like Kyle was saying is when you're on that path and when you're doing what's good, holy and pure, when you're thinking on these things, when you're living a life of righteousness, it's kind of like, but how, you know, how, what, 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 where's the scenario where you're looking at an image you're not supposed to look at if you're not on the site? And where's the anger you're going to have if you're always moving calmly, you're always prepared, you, you leave 20 minutes early. So if there's a traffic jam. OK, well, I get to finish my sermon now and I'm thankful for that. And look how you change your thought to listening to scripture and being thankful versus having road rage, being angry, beeping, pulling your hair out, trying to put mascara on in the mirror with stop and go try. Hey man, just take care of your business and then walk, walk life the way we're supposed to. And it's like, yeah, that's what God called perfect. It, it was never, you know, Jesus was angry, but it was righteous anger. Jesus had to go to the bathroom. Jesus had to do all the stuff we had to do. He just didn't, he just didn't choose the wrong thing in those moments. He was in the same thing. His cart flipped over one time. He scrapped it, scraped his knee. Things happen. He just made the right choice. And I think that's, that's what we're more called to do is, yeah, stuff's going to be there. Just make the right choice. That's what righteousness mm -hmm. is. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Thanks for your thoughts on that, Jeff. Um. <laughs> I mean, I don't know what else I can add to it. <laughs> yeah, Jonathan nailed it, didn't he? Yeah. All right. Good stuff. And so verse three, uh, it says, and Joseph died being 110 years old. So, Man, in like no, normally in, in normal fashion in Jubilees, it's chapters and chapters and chapters before somebody passes away. Here, Jacob's out. Two seconds later, two ch verses later, Joseph's out. Um, yeah, he, so, ain't pull, he ain't pulling a grandpa Abraham. It took seven chapters to die. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But, you know, it's kind of a good a good conclusion of the story. You know, there, there's so Joseph's been in, in the story now since forever long ago when he first got sold and, and the coat and all that stuff. So he's, he's been a part of the story in the background and in the foreground, all over the place ground. And so, you know, it, it's fitting that I, I did get to see my family show up. I did get to see my dad show up. I did get to see my people become a great nation and everybody on my side, because Joseph's essentially a, a early version of Moses. He's an Egyptian by all intents and purposes. Like he's, he's been, he said he lived in Egypt for 80 years. He, he was in working for Pharaoh for 80 years. That, the majority of his life, other than the first 30, he was in Egypt. And even some of that other stuff, when he was with Potiphar and stuff like that, he's still in Egypt. So him and his people honored his real people, his actual family, his bloodline. And I love that that verse is in there. That's like, yeah, and the Egyptians honored all the children of Israel all their days and while Joseph wasn't around. They were like, oh, you see, Joseph, you better take care of his people because that's his people. Now, we've essentially adopted him. You know, he's a transplant, uh, an expat, if you want to call it that. But he's not truly one of us. He's one of them. And he says those are good people. So those are good people. And so all the way up till Joseph's dying, those last years of all his family being together in Goshen, it, again, nothing bad there. Everybody's loving everybody. The, Satan's out of the picture and the adversary in that, in that regard. He watched his dad die. You know, and, and, and while that's sad, that's what he would have preferred. He's like, hey, dad is old. I would prefer to be there with him when he passes. I would prefer to be the one there to bury him because I want to say my last, you know, my last piece. So, yeah, I love that we finally get, you know, jo Jacob passed on in good standing. Joseph passes on in good standing. 
and he was in Egypt for a long time. Like I, I did not, I read through that. I was like 80 years. That's a good, and he never moved into Goshen. He stayed in Egypt that whole time. So that's, that's also interesting that how much of an impact he's had while quote unquote being in the other side, the, the world around him changed because of him. He never changed because of the world around him. One, one versus the world in God math is you always win, you uh-huh. know, and without God math, it's the world versus one. You never win. So, mm-hmm. you know, I, I, Joseph is thinking his heavenly father on a daily basis for one versus the world. And he, he made the impact. And I know I say it fairly regularly, but uh, you know, just again, you don't, <laughs> you don't fake a manuscript. You don't fake, fake a, a document by <laughs> adding a lot of details. Right. Right. 17 years he was in this land, 10 years he was a servant, three years in prison, 80 years under the king. These are things that you should be able to go back if you can find other documents where you can confirm all of this stuff. You know, mm-hmm. so you, you you keep it vague if you're trying to fake a document. You don't get mm-hmm. specific. So, yeah, he looked out his window and he saw sand. You're like, OK, <laughs> was he at the beach or was he in Egypt? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> So you guys think being 110 was kind of young, wasn't it? He had a lot of stress in life, bro. No. <laughs> I was going to say, hey, he, those were a long 110 for him. <laughs> he comes out, prison has changed me. <laughs> <laughs> Not as, I don't know, I, just, I always thought I was a little bit young, though, 110, because um, his dad lives to be, what, about 140, right? Was Jacob about yeah. 140? What was that? You but this, is, this is where they're, like, quickly declining, like, Abraham was 175. Well, Jacob drop was off at daddy to him. <laughs> it's like, what? yeah. Well, it was 30 before that. It was 30 years, 175 to 140, 140 to 110. They started getting real normal right outside of that initial <laughs> covenant. <laughs> outside of the initial covenant with Abraham and the people that were living a touch longer and that first little chunk of people, then it started getting regular as all regular after that. Yeah, but yeah, I, I do agree. I, I, you would think Joseph with his awesome story and the all the ways that God used him and all that you would think like somehow he makes it, but it, it lets you know that it's not the years you live. It's what you do with the years you have. And I think that was my takeaway. So Joe, you're exactly right. His, his life was shorter than I expected. I was like, Oh, I thought he was going to make it a while. Yeah. I, like, I think I, it says here in the last chapter, it says, uh, and Israel lived in the land of Egypt, 17 years. And all the days which he lived were three Jubilees, 147 years. And he died in the fourth year of the fifth week. Mm-hmm. So he has 147. Yeah. yeah. Abraham was 175. So yeah, they start they start going down a little bit. Yeah, and uh we did that video regarding the um it was chapter 23, part one. I just had to look at it real quick, where we were talking about the prophecy in Jubilees, where it talked about how that the the lifespan of man, what it would mm. be in those last days, and kind of how we're we're there, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, and I, I can't remember if it was either 70 or 75 being the average lifespan. And uh, when, when we did the chart, I think it was like 75, 76. Was it, but that was between men and women. Uh, but I know the, the verse there said a jubilee and a half, which would be, you know, 75, 75 years. Yeah. yeah. Give or take. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Anyway, we're we're there, man. Oh, yeah. I wonder what it is worldwide. I wonder what that is. Hmm. The, the average lifespan unfortunately for, probably lower due to malnutrition and stuff like that and you know the big populous states and countries where there's like you know billions of people i think it's still around 75 or 80 though is it huh okay uh, let's see okay i wish we were recording we had a little bit of fun with that um okay so what did we find out boys what's the uh average lifespan worldwide and all that kind of stuff yeah, so worldwide, we were looking at 72 years, and in the U.S., like 77 and a half. Uh-huh. And then there's some outliers all over the place. But, yeah, that's where we get the average is about 72 for the world. So uh, we've, we've gone past the prophecy of 75 years. Uh, we're yeah, on the bottom side. <laughs> unfortunately for us men, um, it's uh, about 73 years of age, 73.5. I don't know where you get the point, the decimals in there, but anyway, 73.5. <laughs> And the women are still have a life expectancy of 79.3. It just depends on how long you can hold a grudge. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I kid, I kid. <laughs> okay. All right, boys. We're ready to get into verse five. Let's do it. 
All right. All right, here we go. And it says that he commanded the children of Israel before he died that they should carry his bones with them when they went uh, forth from the land of Egypt. And he made them swear regarding his bones, for he knew that the Egyptians would not again bring forth and bury him in the land of Canaan. For Machamaron, king of Canaan, while dwelling in the land of Assyria, fought in the valley with the king of Egypt and slew him there and pursued after the Egyptians to the gates of Ermon. But he was not able to enter, for another new king had become king of Egypt, and he was stronger than he, and he returned to the land of Canaan, and the gates of Egypt were closed, and none went out, none came into Egypt. And Joseph died in the 46th Jubilee in the sixth week in the second year, and they buried him in the land of Egypt, and his brethren died after him. And the king of Egypt went forth to war with the king of Canaan in the 47th Jubilee in the second week in the second year. And the children of Israel brought forth all the bones of the children of Jacob, save the bones of Joseph, and they buried them in the field in the double cave in the mountain. Yeah, well, except his bones, huh? Right. Yeah. Well, he was still considered to be Egyptian royalty. You know, you, you can't go in there and take George Washington's bones and take him to, you know, Kansas. They're like, no, dude, get, get out of here. You're right. being weird. But, you know, I think it's interesting that he says, you know, he commanded the children of Israel before he died. So he's, he's still alive, obviously, and he's talking to his people. Hey, before I die, make sure that you take my bones with you when we leave Egypt. Now, Joseph's being mega prophetic here. Because they have just settled in a new land that was given to them. They have the title, as we talked about in the last chapter. So they own where they're at. It, that's where they're supposed to be. They're being blessed. It's the best land of Egypt. Um, Jacob went there. He said, this is where we're supposed to be. Thumbs up. Everything's good. The Egyptians are honoring us. Yet Joseph says something strange. When we leave, make sure you take my bones. What? What do you mean when we leave? We just got uh -huh. here. I don't. What, what are you saying? Because this is going to be 400 plus years from now that we're even having this. Mm -hmm. I don't quite know what you mean, sir. Um, is this something <laughs> we got to worry about? Should I not plant my fields this year? You know, I, I, the people of Israel, they, they knew so much stuff. They honored the father so well. They had the books that Jacob gave them. There was enough details between Jacob and his dreams and visions, all the books that J Jacob had, all the stuff that Joseph was presenting to them. Plus they have the 12 tribes. They have Levi and Judah who was given the priesthood and the role of, you know, being king or ruler, they have way more than we kind of give them credit for. They're not just a bunch of, like, we kind of joke, you know, goat herders, you know, run, running around in a grass field. They knew some stuff, and they were taking care of business. Joseph tells them, hey, when we leave, and they're like, oh, okay. Again, I have to put myself in that scenario. You tell some guy, hey, whenever you move out of your house, make sure, you know, you uh, pull up the baseboards. Like, when I leave my house, I, I just bought this house. I don't mm -hmm. I'm not leaving. What are you talking? You know what I mean? It's like <laughs> it's just really cool to see that Joseph had some well, well advanced forethought to even have that conversation to make sure he was taken care of and that everything went off the way he wanted. Yeah, and I got I want to bring this up. This um this this comment on the side over here is a good point to bring up. So this is given a reference to the testament of Simeon over here mm -hmm. on the right side. And this would be in chapter eight, verse three. It says, for the bones of Joseph, the Egyptians guarded in the tombs of the kings. So the tombs of the kings is where he was buried, right? For the sorcerers told them that on the departure of the bones of Joseph, there should be throughout all the land darkness and gloom. And it hmm. goes on to, to tell more. So um, Testament of Simeon gives some details on that, but that's that's really cool to, uh, to point out. So this isn't just... Uh, this isn't just, you know, hey, this is where we keep the kings and, you know, stay away from there. This is guarded right. all the time, 24-7, right? Like, because they knew that they were blessed when he was there. <laughs> this yeah. is the one thing throughout your generations. You make sure those bones don't go nowhere, mm -hmm. right? So. Now, Kyle, I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're looking at that. Is that that reference is that future talking about you know when one of the plagues where they had darkness cover the land was they were about to leave and they were collecting bones and was some stuff going on behind the scenes that maybe we don't really know when there's this cool connection that we just made today because it just wondered darkness and gloom happening? and remember it said that darkness was like oppressive it was like it almost like but it hurt them almost it was so dark it was like it was a problem it wasn't like you turn the lights off in your room you're like oh it's dark it was like 
This is something else. Goshen was fully lit, normal. Egypt is struggling. They got the mega darkness. Tell you what, hold that thought. I'll grab the Testament of Simeon, and I will read that part so we can get a fullness for it. How about that? Mm, cool. We'll be right back after these messages. Okay, so it is really short, so I'm just going to go ahead and read the, the whole chapter here. Um, and Simeon, or excuse me, and when Simeon had made an end of commanding his sons, he slept with his fathers, being 120 years old. And they laid him in a wooden coffin to take up his bones to Hebron. And they took them up secretly during a war of the Egyptians. For the bones of Joseph, the Egyptians guarded in the tombs of the kings. For the sorcerers told them that on the departure of the bones of Joseph, there should be throughout all the land darkness and gloom and an exceeding great plague to the Egyptians, so that even with a lamp, a man should not recognize his brother. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. Hey. Yeah. That's got to be it. That's got to be, yeah. bro. Gotta be. <laughs> <laughs> so, good stuff, man. Connect the dots. La, la, la. <laughs> <laughs> okay enough of that all so right so, th so that's interesting and uh kyle that because he, he makes he makes his brothers he says in uh verse five and he says and he commanded the children of israel before he died that they should carry his bones with them when they went forth from the land of egypt so yeah he, he already he knows this, this is going to happen but he says and he made them swear like hey mm -hmm. no 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 this is a yeah. matter of fact this was such a prominent thing of course, we know they didn't forget his bones. But think about this. 400 years later, they didn't forget. Mm -hmm. So think about this. 400 years later, that promise is fulfilled. Mm -hmm. This is ge after generations of generations of people. Because once you get so far into those generations, they don't they know of Joseph, but they don't they don't know him. Right. So it's a, it's, it's a cool thing to see that even though it was four about 400 years later, that promise is fulfilled. Yep. You know, and his bones are taken out. But of course, the other things fulfilled as well because darkness did and gloom did fill the land of Egypt at that time. So, yeah. Uh, uh, uh. And what I like too about this story, again, this is where the book of Jubilees helps bring in some clarity because when we're reading the Genesis account, all we get, we don't see the transition of authority here. Uh -huh. We know that the original Pharaoh's already got to be dead, right? More than likely. Yeah, but we don't have Absolutely. any backstory, and why? Why does this Pharaoh not know Joseph? Because it says in Genesis, doesn't he? He knew Joseph not, right? And so now we've getting the backstory of who this person is, where they're coming from, who's their daddy, and what does he do? So, <laughs> um, which is cool because now we get a little bit more of the backstory of what's happening here, and mm -hmm. why things are progressing the way they do for the children of Israel from here forth. So. I see something else that's pretty cool too. So the the part that we read in um, Testament of Simeon there, it says, For the sorcerers told them that on the departure of the bones of Joseph, there should be throughout all the land darkness and gloom. Mm -hmm. so I find that really interesting. So there's something about this covenant. There's something that has, something that is known from the enemy, the adversary, where this information was, given to the sorcerers but they didn't know all the details right or they didn't adhere to all the details at least because this isn't just a matter of keeping joseph's bones there this is a matter of honoring israel it's because they didn't do what they were they didn't honor israel the nation of israel they weren't doing the the ways of israel they weren't you know respecting them at, at that point right because we're at the point of you know using straw and not even getting straw for your bricks you know that kind of stuff right mm -hmm. so when when they finally dip out <laughs> so that's our redneck term for leaving town we dipped yeah. out <laughs> yeah so they're uh so, so they're 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 more they're focused on keeping the bones there rather than honoring the most high you know, mm. honor, honoring Israel, you know, all of that, honoring the nation of Israel. So their, their, their focus is on keeping the bones there because that's what they know. Mm. They don't know the whole story. Whereas they could have, they could have become part of that 
great nation had they just changed their ways. They could have been grafted in. Right. Mm. Crazy. Mm. Mm, 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 mm. Yeah, and we definitely get a little bit of the story of the, I, you know, I said reading until reading through Jubilees, I didn't know any of this stuff. I was like, I don't know. They were in Egypt and stuff happened and then new pharaoh or new king, you know. And then here it's like, oh, well, there was this battle and Canaan was a problem. So, you know, there's almost this, and, and I don't want to put words there that aren't there. But if there's this king in Canaan that's big enough, strong enough to come against all of Egypt, it's a pretty big deal. Now, where was Israel settled prior to being in Egypt over there in Canaan and over there and all that same area, that big giant King dude who can come against Pharaoh, pretty sure he could come against God's people. And I'm not saying that God wouldn't have protected them or that there wouldn't have been a plan already, but they go to Egypt. They're not only fed, they're not only being made a great nation. They're under the military protection of another country. So this king that's so formidable, that's going to be a huge problem in the long run that causes Egypt to all kind of stink. Israel's just like, no, we're good. We're just eating, multiplying, taking care of business. And Egypt's out here fighting the king of Canaan. Well, guess what else is happening? God goes before you and fights your battles. He's taking Egypt to go clear out Canaan. So that mm -hmm. way in a couple hundred years, whenever the land's all done and good and fertile, hey, uh, I got some land for you. I mean, now, now again, we know why they were gone for that much time is all the years they didn't let the land rest, all blah, 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 blah. All the things that they did wrong is why they left the land. Uh -huh. But in the background, God's still working out all the pieces and making sure everything goes off without a hitch. Hey, big giant king in Canaan, we, he can't be there whenever this all goes down. I'll just use Egypt to take care of it, just like I used Egypt to feed you, just like I used Egypt, used Egypt, used Egypt. Kind of feel bad for Egypt a little bit. They're just a tool in the hand of the Father. But on the positive side, isn't that what we're all called to be? Just to be a vessel. You know, you're the potter, I'm the clay. Use me how you want to use me. Joseph was an example of that. Egypt didn't even know any better. They're over there protecting the bones to make sure that they're ready to go when it's time to leave. Make sure these bones are perfect, pristine, in this pretty box with handles. So that way, as soon as Israel shows up, they're just like, oh, look, the bones are just laying here all nicely displayed right here for us to pick up and carry back home to the double cave. How convenient was that? You know, Egypt, <laughs> Egypt along the way is just doing their part in the story. And, you know, I think sometimes we forget to look at the big picture. Like, as I was reading that, I was like, okay, it's a cool little history lesson about Canaan. Like, mm -hmm, I don't know what this means other than time is passing. Oh, this was actually really cool. God was doing something a little bit on the background that, you know, I'm sure mm -hmm. even Israel didn't even understand what that meant. So, and, wow. um, and Kyle, if you'll read that, that next one down on the side. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get all of them on the side there for sure. Oh, yeah, okay, <laughs> okay. But I just want to hit this point real quick. So while Joseph is alive, there's no, there's no Satan, there's no evil, there's no adversary whatsoever, right? Everybody's doing what they're supposed to be doing. Egypt is doing the things to look like Israel. They are fully honoring. Mm. Joseph dies. Now Israel starts changing their ways to start looking like Egypt. Rather than Egypt doing the things that Israel's doing, now Israel starts doing the things that Egypt's doing. So they lose their ability to say, hey, you'll continue to be blessed if you honor what we're doing here. They, they lose that. They, they, they stop becoming the light on the hill. Mm. So Egypt has no respect for them at that point. Our use of you is done, you know? Mm -hmm. mm. Maybe that's why we're not supposed to look like the world out there. Okay. So Joe wanted me to read this, and I'm glad because I was already planning on doing that. <laughs> so again, I will reiterate the same thing I keep saying over and over and over and over and over and over again, is if you are trying to fake a document, you don't put details in there that you can't find in other places uh, because you're going to get found out. Over here, we see Ramesses III from 1202 to 1171 was the founder of the 20th dynasty who repulsed an invasion of peoples from the north and twice, mar twice marched through Canaan, defeated the invaders. Uh, you can find that in the Testament of Simeon 8.2 as well. And then below that, it says a war between Cush and Egypt in which Moses led the Egyptians is referred to by Josephus in Antiquities of the Jews. 210 and then uh, also down here it says um 
400 years later, Joseph's remains would be inhumed. Maybe that's exhumed. I don't know. At the Exodus taken with Israel and buried in the promised land. So, you know, 400 years later, that sounds about the right time, bruh. <laughs> mm -hmm. So very cool. Well, to add a little bit more to what you're saying, Kyle, as well as this has always been my thought is that I, uh, somewhere along the 400 year period after Joseph leaves, it's obvious, or at least to me, it seems to be obvious that they have lost not completely their way, but are probably starting to assimilate a little bit more hmm. and a little bit more because if they were truly keeping the ways, I mean, they had, um, from the forefathers, they had all the information, right? They had the teaching of, I'm sure, Joseph and the and, and the brothers and everything going on for that period of time, for that generation before they passed. So something takes place that they start to lose their identity and who they are. And this is one of the reasons why I believe, too, it was Abba's timing to get them out of there when he did so that they wouldn't be completely lost. Mm. And so when he brings them out of Mitzrayim, what, is, what does dad do? Literally through his prophet Moses, he sets all the kids down and go, hey, by the way, we're, we're going to get a refresher for us. There's nothing new here. It's been this way since the beginning. But I know that we need to go over some, some we, I need, you need some instructions here. And so that's why I believe we have the entire writing of the, the commandments by the finger of God himself. We have all these instructions while we have the book of the Torah so that uh, the wisdom in this was, you know what? If we don't keep this or write this down, it's going to get lost again. And so when, when you were saying it earlier, I said, I agree with you that there was some assimilation that was taking place. And so when they come out and not only that, but we also know there was a mixed multitude. So that mixed multitude is probably not going to have any clue whatsoever <laughs> to this, this God, this God who can travel from Egypt and go over to other lands that they're not used to this. They're getting re-educated. They're getting educated on who this who this Elohim is as well. So yeah, I, I agree with what you're saying. And I think it just lends it uh, lends itself into the story of when they come out and who they are and reestablishing their identity and who they are and who their Elohim is. I don't know why I've never really put much thought into this, but I think it's kind I of I can tell you why. <laughs> <laughs> don't do it to me. Don't do it to me. Um I find it interesting that this is, oh man, this is someone who goes from a, um, a very lowly position to becoming second in command of Egypt. He dies 400 later years later. Then we have someone who was exalted to that position of essentially second in command of Egypt, Moses, who gets made lowly but is still a servant of the people, servant of Yah, the leader, the leader, the example, the whatever. But it's that same position coming out of Egypt. One gets exalted to, one leaves it. I just find that interesting. I bet there's a whole lot more meat on that those bones right there, too. It's like bookends for them, too. Mm-hmm. So at this point, like Egypt, you're you're done. You're done. <laughs> Good job. Thank you. <laughs> We're moving on. Oh, man. Well, so earlier you used the word inhumed. So that word is just to bury. That's the opposite of exhumed. So to dig up, you inhume is to put down. So they took his bones and they buried him in the double cave. They inhumed him in the double cave after they left. Okay. Uh, just for everybody. That is a weird word. I had no idea. So I had looked it up because I was cheating. It's my first time. <laughs> Hear that? So, okay. <laughs> yeah, I was like inhumed. Is that like human? I don't. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> but um, you know, when we talk about the four hundred years, it's it's always, you know, we have, there's a lot of unlearning and learning we have to do with like, oh, they were in slavery for four hundred years. We're, I mean, we're clearly reading on this page. There's no slavery going on at all yet. Not even uh -huh. not even a negativity. I mean, actually, it's the most perfect the world has ever been. Almost so opposite of slavery, maybe like this is example to follow. Much you know so. Yeah, we got to kind of deal with a little bit of that. And I, just, I hope you guys are, you know, as you're reading through and, you know, all of us here that we're trying to, you know, just understand a little bit better of what God was doing and how far he was going and how, you know, his outstretched hand, like literally he was going to the maximum extent to bless his people and to put them in the best scenario possible and doing a lot of stuff behind the scenes. But 400 years is a long time. You know, we look at our nation of America. We've been around 
250 years, something like that, you know, a couple, couple, couple hundred years, most. And how far have we changed in that amount of time? You know, the people who, and I'm not saying that founding fathers and whatever, you know, I know we can go on all these debates on history and politics, but the nation that came and this was established is not the same nation that we have today. The things that we're voting on today, the things that we're considering, the, the current issues were not even potential possibilities at the time when our nation was created. And, you know, there are some ideals. There was a Ten Commandments. There was some stuff that was on courthouses. People still had some family values and morals, and it, it's a different world. So you can see how in 400 years, everything's different. Uh-huh. And these are, these are quote, unquote, God's people. And a lot of people think, you know, our founding fathers in the beginning, the origins of the Mayflower and all stuff, they brought the Bible, the 1611 or the 1560 Geneva Bible, whatever they brought over, you know, that was different than the Bible we have today. They had a standard of living and they were trying to escape for religious freedom. Well, the Egyptian, I mean, the Israelites were kind of leaving for religious freedom and they found it. They found this awesome land flowing with, you know, with leeks and the melons and all the good stuff. Well, we, you know, the people that came to America found this awesome land and it was, had all this cool stuff that was already inhabited. Right. Just like Egypt was. All right. So, you know, I kind of, I want to drive it home just a little bit that, you know, how, they are us and we are them kind of story. And, and I only use that to a very small extent because I don't follow the rest of that conversation. But where that starts is what's going to look like in America in 150 years when we get to year 400. Are we going to be the same people that God's going to have to cause 10 plagues and blow the place up and all that just to wake us up and get our attention? Or are we going to be people that stop, learn our lesson, turn back to him and say, no matter what the world's throwing at us, no matter what things look like, no matter how good the other side looks, we're never going to go that way. We're never going to succumb to the world. We're always going to be a Joseph in the land of Egypt. We're never going to be an Egyptian in the land of Egypt. And so, yeah, it just kind of hit me like as we're reading, I was like, man, we, our story is not too far off. We, we easily could be at 400 year mark. Like I have to literally grab you by your ear and pull you out and cross the waters and get the water out of the ground and da 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 and a bunch of you got to die because you want to build a golden calf and all this craziness what oh you want to get swallowed up by the land because you want to bring weird st- oh you want to bring weird fire like oh i'm trying to save you <laughs> stop dying in the meantime so yeah i just wanted to kind of throw that connection out there and you know make this more real for us today you know we all have to go home today tonight tomorrow whenever you guys are watching this and say man don't be egypt be joseph be right do the pre-problem people don't be the post-problem people <laughs> right now ultimately you know the father's timeline is his timeline and he knows the very the very moment that he's going to start all the stuff that's going to happen right exactly um but until then we have that promise you know if my people who are called by my name will repent and turn from their wicked ways i will heal their land amen you know so <laughs> do that <laughs> get busy <laughs> occupy till i return there you go oh well, i being him not me <laughs> all right we ready to uh read uh 10 i uh, just want to throw something in there just for fun um <sighs> so when we when we look at the 400 or 430 years and this is something i've looked into before and there's some there's a video out there that kind of explains this too but just i'm gonna get to the short of it um so they're saying from the 430 actually began at the time of the promise given to abraham when he was 75 um and that the completion of it going into egypt after joseph dies so it's roughly about 144 years that they were actually in the land of egypt before at least that's what i'm I'm reading here it's so it's not like when, when we we always get told there was this 430 years of suffering that's a long time man you know what I'm saying that's a long time to be oppressed for us. That's you know 430 years, but when we when we start doing that, I'm sure when, you, know, you may find some different math out there, but it's more or less it's it's between 140 to 115 years of the actual oppression, so about a generation or so of oppression. So it's not the full fledged 430 years of them having to make bricks without straw. That's right. Nothing's gonna get done anyway. <laughs> I, I, I know. Uh, I know when we. I know last video um, we were thinking it was somewhere around the 70, 70 year mark. So you're you're thinking it's more along the 150, 150 it years. Be about, it's it's anywhere from one hundred forty to about one hundred fifteen. I, I believe it is that of actual were, slavery. No, no. Well, I'm sorry. Let me take that back. So or is that just in, land? There was Egypt. Egypt. Let me recant that. So the the time of Joseph's death. 
it was about 144 years, what I believe it's saying. But then the oppression didn't happen until after the death of Joseph. Right. So that would be, uh, take the 144, you do the math, Jonathan, 80 years. What is that? Yeah, so like 64, 75 years of actual oppression somewhere in there. So, yeah. Okay. Because we know that from what this is saying, and if you go back and read the Genesis account, they really didn't seem to come into any problems at all until Joseph dies. And then you have the original Pharaoh dies as well. So there goes your, that's a double whammy. So, yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. your in. Yep. All right. Well, that was fun. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Get us, get us going in 10, brother. All right. Let's do it. And it says, And the most of them returned to Egypt, but a few of them remained in the mountains of Hebron and Amron. Thy father remained with them. And the king of Canaan was victorious over the king of Egypt, and he closed the gates of Egypt. And he devised an evil device against the children of Israel of afflicting them. And he said unto the people of Egypt, Behold, the people of the children of Israel have increased and multiplied more than we. Come, let us deal wisely with them before they become too many. And let us afflict them with slavery before war come upon us. And before they too fight against us, else they will join themselves unto our enemies and get them up out of our land. For their hearts and their faces are towards the land of Canaan. And he set over them taskmasters to afflict them with slavery, and they built strong cities for Pharaoh, Python, and the Ramesses, and they built all the walls and all the fortifications which had fallen in the cities of Egypt, and they made them serve with a rigor, and in the more they dealt evilly with them, the more they increased and multiplied, huh. and the people of Egypt abominated the children of Israel. Abominated. Uh. Abominated. So, these are uh, children of Israel, like Bebe's kids. They don't <laughs> die, they multiply. That's right. <laughs> if you get that reference. Cool. Yeah, this, uh, this little section here is interesting because, you know, we all, uh, when I say we all, many of us have watched like Prince of Egypt, watched the old Ten Commandments videos and stuff like that. So, we, we have an image and a, and a thought that's kind of, all congruent with each other. They all are saying the same thing. The story from Exodus, they're all kind of very similar. There's good, then random nothing for a while, then super mean, angry Pharaoh. And you're like, well, where, where, where'd that come from? What happened? Did the people of Israel do something? Then, you know, did, did he kiss his sister or something? Like what happened? And in reality, it really had nothing to do with Israel and, nope. and, and the land. It was, Egypt wasn't handling their business in the war front and they were, they were kind of getting a little scared on, Hey man, uh, we're not as strong as we thought we were. We're not as big as we thought we were. And we have a whole nother people group inside our land. What if by chance they team up and fight us and we're, we're done. So because of war and because of external forces that had nothing to do with anything mm -hmm. they did now, all of a sudden they turn their eyes and they're like, well, those guys keep talking about Canaan. They're like, yeah, that's where our land is, the promised land. They're like, so you want to go back there? So if you go back there, then you're going to come. No, we can't have that. And so it, it's like all like, a, it's all in his head, essentially. You know, the Pharaoh is just making up things of like, but if this, then that, because of this. So I don't know what to do, but let's just oppress him. And then it's like, well, let's abominate him. And then, uh, you know, <laughs> they'll, they'll build our walls and our cities and, uh, I don't know, but we're just afraid of that king in Canaan. And it's like this, we never even hear of the king of Canaan coming to attack. We never hear anything further from that scenario. So we just get like these random details thrown in there of like, this is why I'm angry and I'm taking it out on you. You know, that it's almost like one of those things. And it, it's it's interesting. I'm glad to have that because, man, I, I was just wondering, I'm like, man, Pharaoh is just garbage. He just shows up and is just angry. Like, for what? You know, like, did he sleep on the wrong side of the bed? Sheesh. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree with you on that, Jonathan. The fact that they're getting rocked right now and their defenses are down, they're feeling vulnerable. And again, it's, this goes back to what I said earlier, that God was opening the womb of Israel big time. They're multiplying <laughs> like crazy. And then on top of we're, we just got rocked, our, you know, we, our defenses got, you know, we lost our king, we lost our pharaoh. And then I look over there and I'm seeing this people over here still prospering. 
Mm-hmm. And by the way, they're starting to like really uh, either outnumber <laughs> us or getting close to it. Mm-hmm. So then you get all those. And, and by the way, weren't they from that plant? No, they were from there. You know what I mean? So all these things start factoring in where this paranoia starts setting in where it's like, but again, I think that's part of God's plan anyway. So it was, you know, he had, he had to get them moved out of there at some point. But mm-hmm. yeah, so all, all this plays into the whole narrative of, you know, down the road of let my people go. <laughs> <laughs> Thought you were going to sing the song for a second. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> let me read this over here on the side. I thought this was pretty neat. So the, the note that's, that's over here, uh, this is coming from Bernie is the, the, the guy's name in the Journal of Theological Studies in 1908. And this is uh, pages 321 through 352, where you can read this. So apparently there's more to this <laughs> than just this one thing. Otherwise, <laughs> they, str- <laughs> they stretched each word out over a page, I'm guessing. So. <laughs> okay, so it says, This interesting statement apparently implies that some of the Hebrew tribes were already in Canaan before the Exodus. Or... Is it a remnant of the fact that the tribe of Judah absorbed some South Canaanitish tribes, which were never in Egypt? Mm. So just a couple of neat little things to consider there. Apparently they were getting big, so they were spreading. Mm-hmm. Right. Maybe, maybe even spreading farther than the land that was given to them, potentially. Mm. Yeah. So anyway, that's my two cents. You know, if uh, the new Pharaoh would have been smart, instead of, you know, we get to, uh, uh, what is it here? Uh, I just had it, I'm sorry. Oh, in the middle of verse 13. <laughs> verse 13 is like ginormous. Yeah. <laughs> it's like three three verses long. But it says, come and let us deal wisely. Nah, that ain't what you did, bro. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Come, let us deal wisely with them before they become too many, and let us afflict them with slavery before war come upon us. I'm like, you know what you should have done was went to them and been like, hey, we in this together, right? We got <laughs> our back, we got your back, we got the bones of Joseph, everything <laughs> all good, right? Huh? So clearly yeah. there's still a distinction between them. Yeah. They're yeah. not they're not all assimilated. Okay. Right. Mm. So, but the smart thing would have been like, hey, I got all these people over here. Everything's been good so far. Let's make sure it stays that way. Hey, what do you need? You need anything else? Hey, we got some more land over there. You need you need, you need some more great. I mean, what is it you need? You know what I mean? Instead, it's like, oh, let us steal wisely and beat the crap out of them. <laughs> <laughs> Wise as serpents. That's that's what we'll do. <laughs> I'm thinking to myself, there's there's power in numbers. Mm. So if you would have been smart, you would have made sure they had alliance with you. So that when the king of Canaan showed back up, you're like, hey, not only is it us you're dealing with, but it's you're dealing with them. Mm-hmm. And see how the tables would have turned on that. But, mm-hmm. but, I mean, that's <laughs> not how the story plays out. But, All right. if he would have been wise, truly wise, he'd have been like, hey, I'd rather you be on my side <laughs> than, you know, be for me and not against me. Oh, they were definitely being wise. They just weren't being gentle as doves. <laughs> Good cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and and Joe, to your point, you know, you said let, let us deal wisely with them. And then later in 15, it says, and the more they dealt evilly with them. So, you know, one and a half verses later, uh, let's all get together and figure out what's the wisest thing to do. And then, like you said, what do they turn around and do? They literally deal evilly with them. And so this is this is goes past taskmaster, this goes past indentured servants. Um underpaid workers you know i'm not saying any of that's okay but those are like okay it happens life happens sometimes sometimes you're you know you find yourself in in a bad spot or you know you just need a dollar so you're willing to do whatever mm-hmm. it's different when you're dealing evil with, with people you know and and when we see israel they show up and they're just like this is the scenario that we're in and we're gonna walk this out I, you know obviously they were so mighty that it sounded like you know like joe was saying earlier they're either equal or are greater than so what would have stopped them from being just like, no, we're not doing that. You know, and, and I wonder if that's from all their teachings and from their understanding of, you know, turn the other cheek. When someone tells you to go with them one mile, you go with them two. You you never retaliate because vengeance is the Lord's. So they come in and they say, we don't repay evil for evil. You're dealing evilly with us. 
We're going to multiply through that and make you look crazy as all get out on the back end. You're going to be the butt of this story. Whenever we come out of Egypt, you're going to be the one that's going to be looking dumb. You're going to be the ones holding your negativity in your hands. You got to deal with the 10 plagues. You got to deal with all this stuff. What you designed for evil, the Lord designed for good. So, yeah, you you, you want to you want to get more strong handed with us? We're just going to have more babies. And then what you're going to do? We're going to leave with all our people and all your stuff. And you're going to be left with nothing but a bunch of plagued and cursed land. And then you're going to send your king and best army after us. We're going to kill them, too. And it's not because of us. It's because of what God's going to do. We trust him. We honor him. We know that he's got our back through all this. And all we have to do is walk this out. Love the father. Do as he commands us. Be a set apart people. We're not like you. We're not going to war. We're not fighting other nations. We're not just being ridiculous. We're never going to deal evilly with the Egyptians. And they never did. There's no even with Moses when he kills the man for beating his people. The, it, it again was it the right thing to do? No. But what was his heart behind that? To save his people, to stop danger, to stop hurt and pain and all these other issues. He wanted to be the one to stand in the gap, you know. And when we look at um, what what he did after that, he went to the high he went to the high priest of was it Midian, um, his his father in law uh, Jethro, mm -hmm. and he's learning the ways of the father. He was like Joe was saying earlier, he was getting humbled. You know, he had to go from his or Kyle was saying I believe you had to leave that high position and high rank and then be made low. And the, the lower he was made, the better leader he was for his own people. And by the time he gets into the land, he's out here like. Hey, God, whatever you want me to do, let me talk on behalf of the people. Hey, they're getting ready to sin again. Let me go out and fix this real quick. Hey, me, you and Aaron, let's go handle some business because it's about to get bad out here. They went through so much, but yet they never replied, returned evil for evil. God dealt with them the way they needed to be dealt with. And that was it. And then Egypt gets to be the losing end of the story. And we you know, talk about them now in history and they haven't been a great nation in that same form and fashion ever since. I have a question. Mm-hmm. <laughs> all right boys i need to put you i need you to put your thinking caps on and you in the comments help me out on this too okay so egypt very last verse here let me pull it up here in chapter or verse or was it 16 yep and the people of egypt abominated the children of israel mm -hmm. okay to my knowledge that is the first time i've heard that phrase abominated <laughs> them right We've heard throughout all of scripture, sinned against, sin, sinned against Yah, sinned against the children of Israel, committed abominations or committed an abomination against them. Mm -hmm. But this phrase says, Egypt abominated the children of Israel. And for some reason, I get this idea that this is, they did something to cause the children of Israel to commit abomination. I wonder, and, and as soon as this thought popped in my mind, another thought popped in my mind about our food supply today. I wonder if this has anything to do with, you know, if you're going to eat, you're going to eat what we give you and what we're going to give you. Any meat you're going to get is going to be the meat of things that you don't want to eat because your God says you shouldn't be eating it. So I wonder if they were fed, you know, well, the pork and the shellfish and the, all the that stuff and the bugs and the stuff that they shouldn't be eating. It's either this or you don't eat, you know. So I wonder well, if, if, if Egypt caused them to commit abominations. That's anyway. Okay. Yeah. What you got on that? Well, the word abominated, um, and I and I thought similar to you, Kyle, what, what you're saying, but the word abominated actually just means just another way of saying detest, loathe, or hate. So it says, uh, so if we reread that again, it says, and the people of Egypt either detest it, loathe, or hate it, the children of Israel. Mm. Yeah, so, and I and I want to, and I'll kind of bridge the gap between those this two statements you guys just heard is that when you look at, the scenario that they found themselves in they're not being they're now dealing with the people of israel evilly and like joe was saying or with kyle there, there's something that they're actively doing and they're imparting something bad on them they are doing something that they don't want and shouldn't be doing or shouldn't have done to them without their will without their consent or without their personal expressed desire right, right. so i think the people of israel we know what happened we know what's happening all the babies are getting destroyed 
all the babies are getting sought after. They're getting killed. They're being dashed with the rock and all the stuff that we read later. And that's why Moses is the miracle baby who's put in the basket and saved, you know, set apart mm -hmm. from all the rest of the kids that are just getting not good. Uh -huh. um, and so when you talk about, abom you know, the ab abominable acts, well, these are innocent young children. Right. And so we know what the thing is that happened. And I'm not I'm not saying, Kyle, that you're wrong, because I'm sure there's some other details in there of like, yeah, some crazy stuff was happening. You're getting beat. You got to do work that doesn't make sense. You're working for unfair wages. All the stuff that was going on was all bad. Right. But then when you take it to a level of now, you're in uh, YouTube friendly. Babies aren't alive and things are happening. Uh -huh. You know, then now you've allowed for something to be put on top of you that you don't want and you know that's wrong and you don't have a choice in the matter because you can't fight back in that moment so the only way to fight back was god was like fine i'll just give you a thousand more babies and that like said the midwives earlier they're they're having the babies so fast we can't even find them you know there, it, hopefully there was a few good people that were like i'm not i'm not following that order that's an unlawful order and i don't care who gives it I'd rather lose my own life than take somebody else's. Uh -huh. And so that's kind of more, because I mean, I know when we get into the next chapter and we know the story of Exodus anyway, that's what kind of started this whole process and how Moses made it into the building in the first place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just wanted to, I mean, I, I know that part and, and I appreciate you bringing that up because I mean, that's the, that's the obvious part, right? That's the part mm -hmm. we know about. I'm just, I don't know. I'm just curious. I mean, I guess I'm just speculating and, and curious as to, you have to assume mm. if they're willing to go to that extent where they're getting rid of the children, mm. there's got to be more evil that they're doing because right. I mean, that's and mine and I'm sure probably all of our opinions, that's kind of like the worst of the mm. worst, mm -hmm. you know? Well, I would, I would say this Kyle, um, what they probably did and why it had to be retaught in, uh, let me start from here. They probably took away the Sabbath rest for the Israelites because what they were doing is they were making them work 24, 7, 24. Mm. And more than likely, if this is the same time, the Egyptians had an eight day work week. Mm -hmm. And so um, there was eight days a week on their calendar. So they were probably making the Israelites no rest. You're going to work. You're going to at some point when after Moshe makes the Pharaoh really mad, then you're going to make bricks without straw. So it's going to make it impossible for them to even get their work done. So what he's doing is he's taking them out of the things that I'm, I'm sure that they were taught. Mm. Hey, this, 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 this would have been a common thing. You on the Sabbath, you rest, but now we would through the mixed multitude and then through a whole generation of people um, coming up, the Sabbath's lost. Mm. So all this has to be retaught again. So that, that alone right there, is an abomination to our heavenly father to take away the Sabbath. I like that. And um, as far as the food goes, I would say that they, I mean, they still had all their cattle so they could eat probably what they wanted to. They, you know, they had all that to eat, but I think they were now being forced in a situation where they were losing their understanding of, of who they were. Again, I think they started losing their identity mm. and understanding of who they were. And I think that's why it was God's perfect timing that when, he pulls them out through Moshe. Yeah. I mean, to me, it makes sense that they lost all of it. Mm -hmm. I mean, otherwise, why would y'all have to remind them all of all the thing, all the things, all the, all the <laughs> From scratch. Yeah. It wasn't so, like, they were like, Oh yeah, we know that one. They were like, Oh, oh yeah, we'll do all that. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll change our ways and do that stuff. The, the things that you said. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and for anybody who thinks, unless you've done this before and it's happened to me one time, when I was a young man, right after Hurricane Hugo hit Charleston, um, I was just out of high school and I became a, a, a roofer and I worked on the Air, Charleston Air Force Base with one of the contractors and we were working seven days a week. And I will tell you right now, it didn't take very long for me. To, I did, I would, because every day was the same day. White. It, got, it got to a point where I was like, I didn't even know what day it was because I worked every day. Mm. And that was only for like, <laughs> now imagine about 75 years of oppression uh, and things blending and things changing and people not being able to actually engage on the Sabbath and, and do what the things they did before. All it takes is one generation and the majority of that's wiped out because yep. the next generation coming up doesn't know. Right. You know? So anyway, I just want to throw that in there. Uh, uh, uh. So in this chapter, we have Jacob showing up, 
Jacob passing on, Joseph showing up, Joseph passing on. And and it's one of our greatest desires as humans to die and to pass on, go to the other side, knowing that what legacy we left was good. What legacy we left is for our people and the people around us to be loved, to be taken care of, and set on the best path possible for success. We want our names to be known as something good and to leave a legacy. And I can say for sure, Joseph left such a legacy that the other people around him were impacted, that it took years and years and years of change and adjustments for them to finally forget who Joseph was. He was such an impactful character that it took a while for them to start falling back into their old Egyptian ways prior to him showing up. But what does that tell us? That the world around us is going to always revert back to the world. Mm-hmm. But what does, that tell, what does that mean for us? That we need to continue to stay strong. We need to continue to be the light on the hill, the salt and light in the world never losing our saltiness or else it's just thrown in the street. I mean, it means nothing if we lose that, that makes us who we are. And what is that? It's the light where there's no shadow or variation. It's his law. It's his commands. It's his ways. And it's trying to look like his son, the Messiah, Yeshua, where he walked and talked and lived and did everything in such a way that he says, all right, now follow me. You, you follow the leader. You know, that old game that we used to play growing up. And what are we all called? We're all called children of the most high. We're all brothers and sisters. So I just, you know, leave that imagery with you is just the game of follow the leader. Look to Messiah. And then who would it look to Messiah? Paul. And then what did Paul say? Follow me as I follow Christ. Let's all get in line and let's all head to the kingdom together. Let's all meet there and have our glorified bodies and whatever a hug feels like. I pray that we all get to hug in the kingdom. Amen. And with that, we will see you next time for chapter 47 in the book of Jubilees. God bless. Ciao. Ciao.